Our scripture today comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice from the heavens came saying, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tested by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome to Lent, and I don't mean the stuff stuck in your pockets or in the sides of the dryer. Lent is these 40 days between Ash Wednesday to Easter. Not counting Sundays, those are little Easters, days when we celebrate Christ's rising from the grave. Welcome to the time when people prepare their hearts and community to celebrate Christ's resurrection. But we begin by focusing on the journey of discipleship. We begin by learning more about Jesus and how he lived both as a man and God in one form. We begin with his baptism and then his 40 days in the wilderness, this echo that we practice here in these 40 days of Lent. And it is a journey. Jesus was baptized, and we learned about his baptism in early January when Sabrina led y'all in a remembrance of your baptism. But now we are later, and we're still reading about his baptism. And we hear this echo from last Sunday with the transfiguration, the voice from heaven again saying, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Here it is. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. After Jesus is baptized, he is filled with the Spirit, and then the Spirit sends him into the wilderness. And actually, this is the thing that I sometimes find the most difficult to understand. Why would Jesus be sent out into the place of temptation right after he did something that seemed to be perfect? Something that God declared was something to be proud of. But then, doesn't that kind of seem familiar? Think about it. You do something good. No, not good. Great. And then, more of that stress just keeps pouring on and pouring on and pouring on. We may not have heard God's voice booming out at us, but I'm sure that y'all have all gotten accolades or congratulations or honors or compliments for a job well done. Good tests being written, a good exam, a commendation at work, a dinner which gets compliments, or a wonky thing that needed fixing in the house. And then what happens? Something else goes wrong. A leak happens somewhere else. The promotion went to someone who didn't do as much work as you. The best thing does not always work out. Wilderness happens. And this isn't the scenic view. This is not the part where you get followed around with a camera crew like it's the filming of Survivor. This is when life is hard and things don't make sense and there is no praise and the part of the journey that takes longer and leaves more blisters than we were ready for. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness, tempted, spending time with the wild beasts, hungry, with the sun bearing down at him. And yet, even in the midst of the wilderness, in this temptation, the angels waited on him. Jesus was getting ready for the rest of his journey. Jesus was preparing for his ministry of teaching and healing. Jesus was gearing up for the most exciting three years of his life. Exciting being sometimes the way we use interesting. 
and it was going to be a challenge. And so we prepare ourselves, too. We may not be sent out into the literal Palestinian wilderness, but we are sent out from our places of comfort to places of confusion and discord. That's part of the reason we need this season. It's practice. It's part of our journey of finding our way so that we can also always find our way back to our life in Christ. Our life, our journey, our way back home. The way is in Christ. But y'all know this, and we know these words. We know that we are to walk in the way that leads to life. But where do we start? How do we find the head of the trail, or sometimes even how do we find our way back onto the trail? You ever been on a trail and you're looking and you have no clue where the blazes are? You've been walking so long you don't even know if you can find the blaze again. Sometimes it takes discipline to be a disciple. Discipline is a constant, daily realignment with the call of God. And so in Lent, we are invited into practices self-examination and repentance, prayer, fasting, and self-denial, reading and meditating on God's holy word. What are some ways that you and I can practice these things in Lent? Now, I used to think that Lent was only about giving things up. And now, don't hear me say this, like you can give things up for Lent. When I was a kid, I gave up soda and chocolate. As an adult, though, I started taking things on. One year, I took on the practice of keeping a prayer journal. One year, my family committed to a soup fast. One meal a day was soup for a whole 40 days. We couldn't give up a meal. Uh, Mom would have been really unhealthy if she gave up a meal a day, so we had to find a different way to practice fasting. One of the practices that I have been grateful for is a practice of gratefuls. For the longest time, my sister and I have sent each other three things for which we are grateful for that day. For a while, we were doing it while she was on the other side of the globe from me, and so it was 7 a.m. for me and 7 p.m. for her, and she would hear how my day was starting and I heard how her day was beginning to close. One of the things I have done is centering prayer, a time of meditation and focusing on God. One of my teachers said she made a commitment to eat chocolate each day of Lent. Sometimes we don't focus, we focus so much on what we give up that we don't reason, we don't focus on the reason for the commitment. You could decide to read the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest gospel and it's quite exciting. It moves pretty fast. One woman I know actually memorized the entire Gospel of Mark as a Lenten discipline. One year, I feel like it was all I could do to get over a cold for the entire journey of Lent. My first year in pastoral ministry, I learned how to walk again. A decade or so later, I'm learning how to talk again. We learn about Jesus' sacrifice for us. And we also learn how to live in community with one another. We learn more about the journey. We learn more about the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. We learn how we can turn to God and worship. And so I invite you, siblings in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to the participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the need that we have 
to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, by reading and meditating on God's holy word, to make a right beginning of repentance in this journey of Christian discipline and discipleship as we learn more and more to be like Jesus Christ with those around us. When you feel that you are in the wilderness, know that Christ is there along with you. I want to share with you a prayer poem written by Jan Richardson for the beginning of Lent. All those days you felt like dust, like dirt. It, as if all you had to do was turn your face toward the wind and be scattered to the four corners or swept away by the smallest breath as, ins as insubstantial. Did you know what the Holy One can do with dust? This is the day we freely say we are scorched. This is the hour we are marked by what made it through the burning. This is the moment we ask for the blessing that lives within the ancient ashes that makes its home inside the soil of this sacred earth. So let us be marked not for sorrow, and let us be marked not for shame. Let us be marked not for false humility or for thinking we are less than we are, but for claiming what God can do within the dust, within the dirt, within the stuff of which this world is made, and the stars that blaze on our bones, and the galaxies that spiral inside the smudge that we bear. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is 